Welcome back to Algorithms and Uncertainty. In the last lectures, we've seen a couple of very nice positive results for online learning. Most importantly, we've seen the multiplicative weights algorithm, which worked in the full feedback model. And then we saw the EXP3 algorithm, which works in this partial feedback model. And they gave us regret guarantees. And interestingly enough, in both cases, if we set the number of actions that we have to constant, the regret was asymptotically square root t, or at least the bound that we obtained. Is this the truth, or can we do better? Is this a coincidence that in both cases we get the same depends on square root t? This is what we'll see today. This is no coincidence, because this is, there is a bound, there is a lower bound for the regret, even if you have only two actions you can choose from of square root t. But before we get there, let's quickly recap where we stand. So in the setting that we're considering, we have n actions. An adversary fixes cost vectors, capital T cost vectors, in advance, where each cost uh, is a number between 0 and 1. So for each time step and each action, we have a cost associated. And then we have capital T time steps. Each of these time steps looks as follows. First, the algorithm chooses one of the actions, probably in a randomized way. Then the algorithm incurs costs, which is just lt subscript it, so in the vector lt, the it is coordinate, and then it gets to know, only after having chosen the action, of course, which were the costs of all the actions. This is what we then call experts feedback, or it gets to know only the cost of the action that it has just chosen. And then we introduce the notion of regret. What was the regret? This was how much worse the cost that our algorithm incurs in expectation is compared to the best single action that you can choose. The single action in this entire sequence, so take the minimum over all actions and then sum up the costs of this action. And as I was saying, we got to know the multiplicative weights algorithm and also the EXP3 algorithm. Multiplicative weights worked for the expert's feedback, the full feedback. EXP3 worked for the banded feedback, the partial feedback case. But in both cases, we get something that is grows in t in the square root of t. The bound that we get here for EXP3 is a bit worse in how it depends on the number of actions. But if you consider now, for example, two actions and see just how does this grow in t, you will in both cases see that this grows in square root t. And this is no coincidence, as we will show today. We will show a lower bound on the regret for every possible algorithm. And how will we do this? We will see that actually an algorithm we'll have to predict the outcomes of coin flips. How, how would this make sense? How could you predict the outcome of coin flips? You cannot. Because if a fair coin is flipped, well, you see heads and tails with exactly the same probability. But in retrospect, it turns out that some of the, one of the two choices will have been better. And our algorithm is then actually choosing which of these, or predicting heads or tails. And then eventually what we're comparing this to is what is the better of the two choices. And because it is quite likely that we do not see exactly the same number of heads and tails, but rather that they differ by quite a bit, this will give us 
a lower bound on this term. But before getting there, let's first just only talk about coin flips and how they are not always their expectations, but we have some spread around the expectation. We want to talk about coin flips, namely flip a coin, say, a hundred times. How often do you see heads? How often do you see tails? I hope you remember that the distribution that is defined by this is called a binomial distribution because of the binomial coefficients appearing in the formula. But when you flip a fair coin, say a hundred times, how often do you see heads? How often do you see tails? Well, in expectation, it is 50 times. But this is not what is happening. I tried this out and I got the following numbers. So I flipped a fair coin a hundred times and what do we observe? In my simulations I got the following, namely I got 43, 41, 50, 53, 48, 47, 34, 47, 53, 41 times heads. Good. So I hope this isn't surprising that this is somehow centering around 50, which is exactly the expectation or also uh, the mean in this case, uh, I mean the median in this case, but we also see a number as low as 34, for example. So much, much smaller than the, the mean or the median. And this is actually no surprise, because if you plot the probabilities, this is what it will look like. Here you see what happens when you flip a coin a hundred times. What's the probability? How often you see heads? It will be like, okay, the most likely outcome is actually 50. But you also have a decent probability of this something below 40 and above 60. And this is exactly what we want to bound today or the, which we will make use of, namely that there is a certain probability that we are, well, well, pretty far from the 50 here, namely somewhere down here or up here. Namely, what we want to prove is the following. We will flip a coin for n times and let this be an even number. And so we'll have x be distributed by a binomial distribution with parameters t and a half. So we flip a fair coin t times. The probability that we see heads or tails is both a half. Then we'll have for all alpha, which are non-negative, the probability that Our value x lies between t over 2 minus 
alpha times square root t and t over 2 plus alpha times square root t. This is at most 2 times alpha times e over pi. So, what does this mean? Let's understand this. Here, this, the, the 2, the e, and the pi, those are all constants. This is just something that comes out of our calculations. But what is important now? Here, we are talking about the probability that we are between alpha times square root t and alpha times, uh, between t over 2 minus alpha times square root t and t over 2 plus alpha times square root t. So, this means in this picture here, for example, if we were setting alpha equal to 1, then we would be talking about, for example, this interval. This is exactly square root of 100, in this case, namely 10. And the same about this interval here. And now we are asking about the question, we're asking the question, we're asking what is the probability that we are in between this interval? So how big is the probability that we are inside here versus there's still, of course, probability down here and up here. And we say, we will show that the probability between this, the mean minus alpha times square root t and the mean plus alpha times square root t is at most 2 times alpha times e over pi. So if we only set alpha small enough but, not a, but still a constant, then we can see that here within this interval, maybe it's then smaller, alpha equals 1 will give us you something that is bigger than 1, that's not meaningful, but if we set alpha much smaller than this, then we'll have maybe even the probability of only a half inside this interval. So this is something that we could do here, namely choose alpha to be, um, well, maybe just a tenth or so. Then we are talking here about the probability that we are inside here, and this will be smaller than a half. So it is actually more likely that we are outside this tiny interval than that we are inside this interval. So in principle, this is where the square root is coming from. This is the lemma. And by the way, this, this is no surprise that we're talking about the square root here, square root t, because this is exactly the standard deviation, or it is proportional to the standard deviation. So let's prove this lemma. It's actually nothing complicated. Let capital J be the small j such that uh, we are somewhere between t over 2 minus alpha times square root t and t over 2 plus alpha times square root t. So what we are now interested in, of course, is what is the probability that x will be inside j. And this is nothing but summing up the probabilities that we have inside that interval. Now we'll have to talk about the probability that x takes the value j. What's that probability? Well, this is just the definition of the binomial distribution, but you can also figure this out yourself. Namely, what is the probability that we see 
J times hands when we flip a fair coin, capital T times. Well, every sequence of heads and non and tails is equally likely. There are two to the power of t possible such sequences. Each of them is equally likely. And exactly t choose j of them have exactly j times heads. So this is where this probability is coming from. Now, in order to get this bound here, all we have to do is bound this binomial coefficient. And to this end, we will use Sterling's approximation of the factorials. Namely, What we have is that k factorial is at least this much here, some constant times k to the power of k plus a half times e to the power of minus k. And we also have an upper bound which looks almost the same but the constant is different. And this is true for all k. So this is something that we can use to bound any of these binomial coefficients. Namely, what we can do is we can say how big is t choose t over 2. This is nothing but t factorial divided by t over 2 factorial times t over 2 factorial. And now we can use these bounds here. Once we, for the numerator we can use this upper bound here. For the denominator we will use this a lower bound. And what is it that we're getting? Well, the numerator will get e to the times t to the power of t plus a half times e to the power of minus t. And for the denominator, we'll get square root of 2 times pi times t over 2 to the power of t over 2 plus a half times e to the power of minus t over 2. And this we're getting 2 times here, so we'll have to take the square of this. Good. Let's now do the math for what we're getting down here. Now we'll have to take the square of this, the square of this, the square of this. So let's first copy the numerator. And for the denominator, we're getting 2 pi times t over 2 to the power of t plus 1 times e to the minus t because actually we only have to multiply each exponent by 2. And now things actually simplify already a lot. How are they simplifying? Well, what do we have here? We see, okay, this cancels. And then we have e over 2 pi sure, times 2 to the power of t plus 1 times t to the power of t plus a half. And this we divide by 
t to the power of t plus 1. Now how much is remaining? We can further cancel this plus 1 with this 2 and we can cancel this with this but what is remaining then is t to the power of a half. So what you're getting here is nothing but e over pi times 2 to the power of t divided by square root t. This is an upper bound on this binomial coefficient. And by the, bin um, by the monotonicity of all binomial coefficients, I hope you recall that binomial coefficients are maximized when this, this number here is exactly half the upper number. So by this we are getting that t 2 j will always be at most this bound that we've just derived. And this is true for all j. And now, where did we want to go? We wanted to upper bound this. And fortunately enough, we now have an upper bound for t choose j, namely this. Good, so the probability that x takes value j, this was equal to 1 over 2 to the power of t times t choose j, this is at most 1 over 2 to the power of t times e over pi times 2 to the power of t divided by square root t. So it is nothing but e over pi times 1 over square root t. And what does this tell us? This tells us that the probability that x is inside this interval, which we were defining from minus alpha squ times square root t to plus alpha times square root t, that we are inside this interval, which is nothing but taking the sum over all probabilities inside this interval. This is, of course, at most, the size of that interval times our upper bound on each of these probabilities. And how big is this interval? This interval has length at most 2 times alpha times square root t. So we're getting our 2 times alpha times e divided by pi. Good. So, this is a very simple lemma, just showing what we were, uh, what, what we were expecting. Okay, maybe we we're, were not expecting it this literally, but I think it's not surprising that we can derive a bound which tells us, okay, with some certain probability, we see a number of coin flips which is far away from um, the mean. This is a bound that we don't usually need. Usually we're talking about quite the contrary, namely that we talk that something is concentrated. This is actually the, the opposite kind of a bound, namely just telling us some anti-concentration, that it is likely that we're far enough from the mean. How do you prove this? Well, there's actually nothing fancy happening here. All that we're doing is bounding each of these individual probabilities and seeing, okay, now it has to happen that we're somewhere, uh, that there is only bounded probability 
inside that interval. And next, we will use this anti-concentration to derive a bound on the following quantity. What is the minimum number of the, two, the following two numbers? You count the number of heads that you see and you count the number of tails that you see. What is the smaller of the two? What is the expectation of this number? Of course, you might say, well, usually I will see, well, in expectation, I'll see as many heads as I will see tails. But in each case, whatever you do, only if you see exactly the same number of heads and tails, this will be a half of or t over 2, in this case, if you have t coin flips. The minimum of the number of heads and tails will usually be smaller than this. And now, based on this lemma, we can even show an upper bound on this expectation, because it is just likely that the number of heads is outside this interval, which will make always this minimum small. So what we'll show is the following lemma. We again consider an even positive integer. And we again consider some random variable x, which is drawn from a binomial distribution with parameters t and a half. So still we're flipping a fair coin, capital T times. And then we now claim that the expectation of the minimum of x and t minus x is at most t over 2 minus something, namely 0 0.06 times square root t. This year, this 0 0.06, this is certainly not the best constant that we can achieve, but this is just something that comes out of our calculations. So once again, what does this mean? Flip a fair coin capital T times. Now, how often do you see heads? x times. How often do you see tails? Well, t minus x times. And what is the smaller of the two numbers? That's again a random variable. This will surely never be more than t over 2. Why not? Because you're flipping the coin t times, so the sum of these two will of course be t, and the smaller one of them will be of course no more than t over 2. But what this is now telling us that the expectation of the minimum is even bounded away from t over 2, namely we this constant times square root t smaller than t over 2. Let's prove this lemma. It's actually not complicated either. We can ask what is the expectation of the minimum of x and t minus x? Well, let's just write out the definition of this expectation. As I was saying, we never see a value which will be bigger than t over 2. So we'll only have to take the sum from 0 to t over 2. And then we take j times the probability that we see value j. And now we can upper bound this. Namely, what we'll do is just 
say, okay, either we're smaller than t over 2 minus alpha times square root t, Then we'll count this as t over 2 minus alpha times square root t. Or we are above this. Then we'll just count this as t over 2, because t over 2, that's just the largest value that we will ever see. Now, how big is this? Let's first do one simple step, namely, let's move out t over 2 minus alpha times square root t. And then we'll see alpha times square root t plus uh, times the probability that the minimum is bigger than t over 2 minus alpha times square root t. So what's happening here? Well, nothing. We just moving out this term here, and then if this event here takes place, we'll add the remaining alpha times square root t, because those two numbers here sum up to 1. Cool. Now this is something that we know how to bound. Why that? Because here we're talking about the probability that the minimum of x and t minus x is bigger than something. What does this mean for x? If the minimum of x and t minus x is bigger than this here, then x will have to be between t over 2 minus alpha times square root t and t over 2 plus alpha times square root t. If it is outside this interval, then this event will of course not take place because either we are uh, below this here, then of course the minimum will be smaller, or we are above this, then the t minus x will be too small. Good. And for this kind of a probability, we already derived a bound. What was our bound? Our bound was this much. It was 2 times alpha times e over pi. So this probability here is at most 2 times alpha times e over pi. So what was it that we were bounding here? We were talking about the expectation of the minimum of x and t minus x. And what we see here is that this is now at most t over 2. minus alpha times square root t times 1 minus 2 alpha e over pi. And this holds for every alpha. So what you could do now is you could now 
optimize this, take the der derivative by alpha and see what's the best bound that you will achieve on this expectation, but I will do just something much simpler than this. If we set alpha to be a half, then we'll have that alpha times 1 minus 2 alpha e over pi will be at least 0 0.06. So this will give us that the expectation of the minimum of x and t minus x is at most t over 2 minus 0 0.06 times square root t. So again, nothing super complicated is happening here. We're just using the definition of the expectation and we're using the bound that we've derived before. So again, this can be considered as some kind of an anti-concentration bound, but this is actually something that you will see for every random variable that, of course, um, the minimum of x and something minus x, this will always be smaller than what you um, what, than the, the expectation. Now here this is quantitative, Name, and this will be important, namely that we are now away by some square root t. And this is now, I hope where you see the, where the, the square root t was coming from, it, is, it was coming from exactly these anti-concentration bounds. The meaning of this square root t is exactly that it is the standard deviation that with a constant probability we are outside of the interval defined by the standard deviation around the mean. And this is what we formalized here with these calculations. And what we'll do next is use exactly this lemma to derive a lower bound on the regret by making our algorithm predict coin flips, which is just impossible, but in retrospect, this seems that there is one choice better than the other. Now we'll finally derive a lower bound on the regret of any algorithm. And by that I mean it's not just a lower bound on the regret of the multiplicative weights algorithm or the exp3 algorithm, but literally just any algorithm, because we will see that for every algorithm there is a sequence of cost vectors such that the regret that the algorithm has on this sequence will be at least square root t or some constant times square root t, but we, are, we can construct this with only two actions. What will these two actions be? The algorithm will have to predict the outcome of coin flips. The algorithm has to say, okay, I'm now expecting heads or I'm expecting tails. How should an algorithm do this? Well, it cannot do this better than just saying, well, heads and tails both are equally likely, so it doesn't really matter what I'm predicting. But the point is that in retrospect, in this sequence, one of these two choices will have been better a, a significant number of times, which is exactly coming from these anti-concentration bounds that we were just deriving. So beforehand, before actually these coins are flipped, there's nothing that you can predict because both is equally likely, but what we are evaluating the algorithm on, namely what is the best choice in hindsight, that suddenly turns out to be 
different. Namely, one of the two options is better there. More precisely, we'll now show the following theorem. Even for n equals 2, so if we have only two actions, no algorithm guarantees an external regret in little o of square root t. And to prove this, we now only consider the t, uh, the case that t is an even square number. So that this square root t, for example, is well defined. And now what we'll do is we want to show that there is a bad sequence. And to do this, we'll generate a random sequence. And this is pretty much like how we were doing this when we were using Yas principle, that we are generating now a random sequence in which the algorithm will be bad in expectation. And we will namely show that in expectation, the regret will be at least 0 0.06 times the square root of t. This expectation here is taking over the random sequence. So this tells us that There is a sequence L1 through LT such that the regret is at least 0 0.06 times square root t because if there were no such sequence then, of course, this, uh, the expectation taking over any sequence would also be smaller than this. Cool. So all we have to do is actually do the following. We'll have to generate a random sequence and show that the expectation of the regret on this random sequence is at least 0 0.06 times square root t. And how do we define this random sequence? For each t, we set lt equal to 1, comma 0 and lt to be 0, comma 1. with probability a half each. Good. So this is exactly what I was saying by the coin flip that we'll have to predict. Either we, are, uh, we have to predict heads or we'll have to predict tails. So let's say this first action means predicting heads then this means here that our coin shows tails because then we are not making a mistake when the coin shows tails whereas we do make a mistake if the coin shows heads and here
exact, the exact opposite is happening. Good. Now, this is all happening independently. So what's happening in step T is independent of what's happening in steps T minus one or T plus one. Now, how would you play on such a sequence? If you know, this is the next cost vector that will show up. Well, you could now choose the first action or the second action, and you realize it doesn't actually matter, because regardless of what you do, you will have an expected cost of a half. Why is this? Let's do this maybe a little more formally. Um, if we consider LT ELG as the cost of the algorithm that we'll have in step T when I using this P probabilities, like the ones that we defined for, so this don't have to be the ones that we defined for uh, multiplicative weights, those can be any P's, because what we'll now see is that, of course, these P's have to be independent of the L. This P this is, this may of course depend on the sequence that we've seen up to this point, but they do not depend on the cost vector in this current step. So the expectation of L L T will be just well of course by linearity of expectation we can first take these two things apart and then we can see okay because they are independent we can also take the separate expectations. And how big are this and this? Well, we see both of these vectors equally likely. So they will be a half each. And so what we're getting here is that this is a half times the expectation of P1t plus P2t. And what do those sum up to? This is, of course, 1, because this is just split, um, our algorithm is just splitting up the probability of playing the first action and the second action. This will always together be one. So regardless of how the algorithm defined these probabilities, the expected cost that it will incur in a step is always a half. So the expected cost that our algorithm incurs, which is nothing but the expectation of the individual steps that we'll have, this will always be t over 2. Good. So far, I think it's not really surprising. Because if you are 
supposed to predict coin flips. What can you do? Well, there's nothing that you can do. You can either set, say, always say heads, you can always say tails, you can move between that. Well, you have no idea how to predict the, coin, the outcome of the coin flips. This is exactly what's kind of formalized here. In expectation, the number of mistakes that you'll make will always be t over 2, regardless of how you do that. There's not even a reasonable hedging strategy, hedging against, okay, now I've seen so often heads, now all there's tails coming up for sure. No, because this is happening independently, you will make these mistakes over and over again and you will have in expectation a cost or namely the in the expected number of mistakes that you'll make will be exactly t over 2. But now we'll come to what is the best action that you could choose and the amazing or annoying thing is that we're now asking this in hindsight because we're asking for every sequence what is the best or for, for every realization of the coin flips what is the best choice so fix any sequence then of course you would predict heads if there's heads happening more often you would predict tails if there's tails happening more often and as we've seen, it will usually be happening that there is a gap between the number of heads and the number of tails that you see. And it's not just that, that you see always t over 2 times each of them. And we'll do now this exactly as follows. We'll compare this to the expectation of the minimum of the LIT. And what is LIT? L1T. This is nothing but, well, we can write this in two ways. We can write this as the sum of the L1T. Or we can just see that this is distributed according to a binomial distribution with parameters t and a half. And how about L2t? This is, well, of course, nothing but take the sum over all small L2. But this is nothing but capital T minus L1t. So, this tells us that the expectation of the minimum of LIT, this will have to be nothing but the expectation of the minimum of L1T and T minus L1T. And this we know is at most t over 2 minus 0 0.06 times square root t. This is exactly the bound that we showed before. So this tells us now that the expectation of the regret which is nothing but the expectation of the algorithm's cost minus the cost of the best action. This will now, by linearity of expectation, be at least 0 0.06 times square root t. And if I'm not mistaken, 
this is exactly what I claimed would be happening, namely that the expectation of the regret is at least 0 .6, 0 0.06 times square root t. Good. So, once again, how does this proof work? We generate this random sequence. In advance, we don't know what the sequence will look like. It will just have the outcomes of coin flips or what, what you'll actually have to do is you'll have to be predicting the outcome of coin flips. But in retrospect, we will have generated a sequence where one of the two actions will have actually been better. But in advance, we don't know which one of the two is better. This is only what we know in hindsight. In hindsight, one of the two actions turns out to have a strictly cheaper cost than the other because it was correct more often. And so this tells us that there is always a sequence. For every algorithm, there is a sequence such that this algorithm has a regret of at least square root t, or some constant times square root t, even when there are only two actions. And of course, for some algorithm, there might be even sequences where the, the regret is even worse than this, sure, but certainly um, there, um, well, in, on this particular sequence, all algorithms even have the same kind of regret or in, in expectation the regret will be the same just by the fact that it doesn't actually matter which algorithm you apply here. One thing that is, of course, that we're not taking into consideration here is what happens if you have more actions. Then, of course, this cannot get any better because you can always, and if you have more actions, uh, if the algorithm has more actions, then this still things like this can happen. But you can make the, 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 the things for the algorithm even more complicated because now the algorithm has to choose between multiple of these actions and this will make things more difficult for the algorithm. Also, what we're not using here is the kind of feedback. And even the feedback doesn't actually matter here, because what's, what's ha what has happened so far has actually nothing to do with what's happening in the future. Only in hindsight it turns out that one of the two choices would have been better, but what is good in hindsight doesn't actually tell us anything for the future. This is something which I find somehow mysterious here, but that's somehow the magic of independent random variables, that only because you, um, you've seen something, this does not give you, or you, you've seen something which did not look like what you're expecting, this still doesn't tell us that, that in the future you will suddenly get lucky. So it's not like when you're repeatedly unsuccessfully playing the lottery, for example, then it is more likely for you to win next time. It is actually equally likely. That's the point of independence. Good. Now what I'll do want to do next is talk about UCB1 again. Because with UCB1 we also get this some regret guarantee which is like square root t, but as it turns out the guarantee is a little different. And this is I think something that we should be talking about. How is the regret guarantee that we get for UCB1, which was also something like square root t, but which was in a different model. How is this different from the square root t guarantee that we derived for multiplicative weights and for exp3? And how is this different also from the lower bound that we derived here? 
I hope you, you remember that a while ago we got to know this UCB1 algorithm, which used these confidence bands for the online learning problem. But there are mainly two things which are different there compared to the setting that we've now talked about with the multiplicative weights and also the EXP3 algorithm. What was different there? Well, the one thing was that we were talking about rewards rather than costs. That is actually a no-brainer, as we'll see in a minute. And then the other difference was that there we were playing against probability distributions. We, the, we had to choose from one of n actions or arms, as we called them there, and we wanted to say, okay, we want to maximize our expected reward and we're comparing ourselves to the best of these arms. And then our benchmark was this expected regret. How good are we doing compared to the best arm? And this is indeed a big difference. And the difference is that this other regret notion that we use for UCB1 is actually weaker. The reason being exactly the lower bound or the, the reason is exactly the same as what we had for the lower bound for multiplicative weights EXP3 and other algorithms in that model. But before we get there, let's first talk about costs and rewards and let's see that they actually make no difference in these questions here. So we can say that if action I as reward GIT, we can define a cost LIT as 1 minus GIT. And then we can treat this just as a cost minimization problem. So in particular, for the external regret, we would then have that the external regret, which was, as you remember, the expected cost of our algorithm, minus the cost of the best single action in this particular sequence. But we could now also rewrite this by namely replacing the L's by the G's. And this works really nicely here. Because what you can see now is that, okay, these sum up to t, but that doesn't actually matter. So you can, you, you'll get some t minus the expected reward of your algorithm minus t plus the reward of the best action in your sequence. So the regret is nothing but the maximum of all the rewards in our sequence minus the expected reward of our algorithm. Good. So you could turn our entire setting so far 
where we were talking about the external regret, as it was, for every possible sequence, what is the best action on that particular sequence. You could also talk about rewards rather than costs, and you would get exactly the same kind of guarantees, namely the regret. You would now say, what's the best action on that sequence minus what is the expected reward that you're achieving on that sequence. Fantastic. So you can move between the two. Sometimes it's better to talk about these rewards. Sometimes it's better to talk about these costs. It doesn't actually matter. You can use the same algorithm for both. But for UCB1, we didn't actually bound this quantity here. We bounded a different quantity. UCB1 gives a guarantee for the expected regret which is slightly different namely what we'll have here is the maximum over all actions and what is now their expected reward Back then, we would just wrote this here slightly differently because we were saying, okay, they are all identically distributed here. We're taking the reward of action, the expected reward of action i in, in any step, and we'll multiply this by t. But what is now important for me is that this here is by no means the same as the expectation of the maximum. So if we were applying um, an algorithm like exp3, we would get a bound on this here, and maybe we'll draw a we'll play be playing on a random sequence, then Then we'll see, okay, the expected regret, or the expected external regret, I want to say here, by time t. This is, as I was saying, the expectation of what we were bounding up here. So, the expectation of the maximum. minus the expected reward of our algorithm. And this will be at most in the, the guarantee that we obtained there was 3 times square root n times t times ln n. And this turns out to be stronger why that? Because these two things can be very different. So for UCB1, we, all, we got that this quantity here was in the order of square root n times t times, I guess it was ln t then, which looks very similar to this. But it is a weaker guarantee exactly for the reason that here you're taking the maximum of the expectation here, take, you're taking the expectation of the maximum. And these two can be apart quite a bit. Why is this? This here will usually be smaller than this one, and this is exactly what was what we exploited for the lower bound. In the lower bound, we were, this quantity here, the maximum 
of the expectation for any, uh, for any action, this is always t over 2. But the expectation of the maximum, or in that case it was the expectation of the minimum, but that doesn't actually matter, uh, that's just flipping the sign, this was significantly away from t over 2. Namely, it was um, we, we had some square root t that we were apart from this. So this tells us that the regret guarantee that we're getting for EXP3 is actually a stronger one than the one that we're getting for UCB1. At the same time, there is also a lower bound for even the regret for even this regret notion that we used for UCB1, also there you cannot be better than square root t, but this is not what we showed today. What we showed today was only um, for EXP3 and alike. Now there's one more thing I'd like to be talking about, namely, what if we don't know the time horizon? So far, we adjusted our algorithms to the time horizon so that the regret actually gets this square root t, for example, or whatever factor times square root t. For this to adjust the learning rates, for example, we needed to know the time horizon in advance. But what if we don't know this time horizon? What can we do then? Fortunately enough, there is a very simple trick. Namely, what we can do is we can just start with one guess for the time horizon, and if the sequence goes longer than our guess, then we restart the algorithm, which with a higher guess of the time horizon, namely we'll double our guess. And whenever the time horizon actually turns out to be bigger than our guess, we will again double it. So the algorithm will now look as follows. We'll turn an algorithm for a known time horizon into one for an unknown time horizon as follows. We will have phases. And the first phase is phase zero, and they consist now of the following time steps. Um, phase k consists of the time steps 2 to the k up to 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1. So, for k being 0, for example, we include time step 1 up to 2 to the power of 1 minus 1, so up to 1. So, phase 0 consists of exactly time step 1. Phase 2 consists of time steps, and phase 1, which consists now of time step 2 and 2 to the power of 2 minus 1, so this will be 4 minus 1, so phase 1 will consist of time steps 2 and 3, and so on. And each of these phases will have, of course, length 2 to the power of k. And what we'll do is, in phase k, we'll start the algorithm And by this, I mean we'll start the algorithm from scratch with a time horizon estimate of 2 to the k. And what we want to show now is that this doesn't harm our regret guarantee by a lot.
Namely, what we'll show is if the algorithm, if the original algorithm has regret at most alpha times square root t on any sequence, the modified algorithm has regret at most square root of 2 divided by square root of 2 minus 1 times alpha times square root t. So what could this look like? This could be, for example, the multiplicative weights algorithm. For this we would have alpha being 2 times square root of ln n. And then what we're getting instead is some other factor times square root t times ln n. Or for exp3, we would have that alpha is equal to 3 times n times square root n times ln n. So what we actually only lose here is some constant factor, but the dependence on n and t just remains the same. Good. Let's prove this theorem. How does this work? Well, um, how many sequence, how many phases do we start in our sequence if we have a time horizon of t? You will easily figure out that we start m, which is the log to the base of 2 of t rounded down plus 1 phases during t steps. And to now complete also the last phase, we'll just fill it up with zero vectors. So the last phase that we're starting is of course phase m minus 1, because the, the first phase was called phase 0, so the, the last phase here is m minus 1, and I hope here you now see, okay, 2 to the m minus 1, this will always be at least t, by exactly this definition. Good. Now, adding all zero vectors will not change the cost of our algorithm or the cost of the best action. Now what do we have? In phase k, we'll now have the following. The expected cost of our algorithm in this phase is at most the cost of the best action in that phase plus alpha times the number of steps that we have in this phase, where now here I use this notation pk, this is the steps in that we see in phase k. And this is just the regret guarantee that we have for phase k because we were starting the algorithm from scratch for phase k. Now, 
if we take the sum over k from 0 to m minus 1, so all phases that we have, what do we get? already moved this sum here inside the expectation. And you now I'll get the first term summing up over the expect uh, over the minimum for all phases plus taking also the sum of these alpha times the length of the phase as of this taking the square root. Cool. Now how big are these things? This here, this first thing, this is of course nothing but the sum over all time steps from 1 to 2 to the m minus 1. So we're adding up really over all time steps here the cost that the algorithm incurs because every time step belongs to exactly one of the phase. Now how about this here? This is a little different because here we have a sum over a minimum but this will be no more than the minimum of the sum. And again, we're summing up over all time steps here. So what is it that we're doing here? This actually is the best action only for phase k. And what this is actually doing is this is a slightly stronger benchmark, namely comparing ourselves to the best action in phase 1. Uh, so in phase 1 we'll use the best uh, action, or in phase 0 we'll use the best action for phase 0. In phase 1 we'll use the best action for phase uh, one and so on and this is of course can only be better than the best single action throughout the entire sequence and what is the last thing here this is alpha times and then we'll have what is the length of a sequence the length of the k sequence is exactly 2 to the k and now what you can see is that this will be no more than or let me first say that this is equal to 2 to the square root of 2 to the power of m minus 1 without the minus 1 divided by square root of 2 minus 1. This is just because this is a geometric sum. Now let's leave out the minus 1 there. And how big is square root of 2 to the power of m. Square root of 2 to the power of m is nothing but 2 to the power of m divided by 2. Or 2 to the power of m to the power of 1 half or the square root of this. But what was 2 to the power of m? m was the logarithm of t rounded down plus 1, so this will be no more than 2 times t to the power of a half, or in other words, the square root of 2 times the square root of t. Okay. 
So what does this overall tell us? This tells us that the expected cost of our algorithm This is what we see here on the left hand side. This is at most the cost of the best single action. Plus, and now we'll have square root of 2 times square root of 2 minus 1 times alpha times square root t. And I realized that I forgot to keep this alpha here, but that just we left unchanged. Good. And this is exactly the kind of a bound that we wanted. Because we could also now write that the regret at time t, this is at most square root of 2 divided by square root of 2 minus 1 times alpha times square root t. So this is actually not too complicated to do. We just have our guess for the time horizon and then we keep doubling if our guess turned out to be wrong and we're losing only a small constant factor. So we now have, for example, the EXP3 algorithm, which needs kind of no information in advance. It doesn't need to know how long the sequence will be and it doesn't need to get any feedback besides the cause of the action that it has just chosen. I, to me, this is still amazing how good this works and that this is still comparably easy to how strong the outcome is. Of course, our benchmark is only the best single action and not something like the best action sequence. Or there's also a notion of regret where you can replace whenever I chose this action, I'll now choose that other action. There are also regret notions like this, but um, we will not cover them in class here. What we'll do instead is we'll talk about a generalization of all this online learning framework towards a problem of convex optimization, towards a perspective of convex optimization. There again as a special case we'll see the experts problem. We'll not exactly revisit these Bannett's versions, um, although they exist for that, but we'll see that we can also model other problems, like for example, a version of um, online regression. All this we're doing in the next two lectures. Please do let me know if you have any questions in the meantime, and I hope to see you next time. Stay safe. Bye.